Hello and welcome. I'm Sharon English. I'm director of the Writing and Rhetoric program here at Ennis College. And thank you for joining us for How to Pronounce a Knife, a book talk with author Subenkam Thamavanska, moderated by Jack Wang. Our event tonight is co-sponsored with Innes College, or sorry, with the New College at University of Toronto. And I'd like to pass things over uh, for a moment to Bonnie McElhinney, the principal of New College, who is going to give our land acknowledgement. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, welcome uh, to everyone on behalf of New College. Uh, as Sharon said, I'm Bonnie McElhenney. I'm the principal of New College. I'm delighted to be here with all of you and um, to welcome alumni and guests from New College, from Innes College, from the Writing and Rhetoric Program and across the university. I see 335 participants tonight. So it's a very exciting event. Um, as we uh, all gather to hear from the, the prominent and esteemed author, uh, Sivankam Thamavangsa, who is an alum of New College in 2003 and this year's Giller Award winner. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And today this land is still a meeting place and home uh, to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island. And we're grateful to have the opportunity to work and think on this land. This acknowledgement asks those of us who are settlers to consider what our responsibilities are as treaty partners, uh, what our responsibilities are to uphold treaties, as do recent actions, um, the land back lien, uh, dispute um, at Six Nations, the Wig Wasika land sovereignty camp on Taylor Creek. Indigenous colleagues uh, recently built a ceremonial lodge at New College in the Quad. It's called the Mother Earth Learning Lodge or in Anishinaabe, the Aska Komi Go Kwek Wikamig to build community and relationship with the land um, and to reconcile intergenerational trauma when we're able to meet in person, it'll be a, a place of um, ceremony for Indigenous students, faculty, and staff, and uh, also a place for knowledge um, exchanges. So all of this is what we hear when we hear um, the land acknowledgement, and we also hear more, and we need to learn, I think. I think what it asks us to do is listen um, and not just hear. We're gathered tonight. Um, to, uh, to have a, a wonderful conversation um, with a distinguished author. I, I was just telling Suvankam that I read uh, her New Yorker article, uh, her New Yorker um, short story uh, just last night. So, so exciting to see the work um, spreading uh, and, and getting ever brought more wi widely known. I told her that when I read her short stories, it felt to me like they were etched in acid and like the land acknowledgement. Her work asks us to think about what it means to be in complex, uh, tense, and sometimes good relations. So I'm looking forward to this evening, and I, I want to now pass the stage over to the principal of Innes College, Charlie Kyle. Actually, it's me. <laughs> Thanks, Bonnie. Thank you so much. Um, like some here tonight, I'm sure I first heard about um, Sue Bencombe's book when it won the Giller Prize last November. And as a lover of short stories, um, a teacher of short stories, a writer of short stories, uh, this really caught my attention and excited me for it's not that often that stories um, and not novels draw that kind of intense attention. So I knew I wanted to invite her to uh, speak about her work here. Innes College has been developing a kind of a tradition of book talks such as tonight's, creating a space where authors can speak to each other about the significance of their work and then share that with the community is very important to us at Innes College. Um, it resonates deeply with the aims of the Writing and Rhetoric program, which is to foster and support 
emerging young voices as well. This past September, Ennis alum Jack Wang was one of the first authors to have such a book conversation event um, created around the launch of his book, We Too Alone. And we were really happy when Jack agreed to join us tonight again, but this time as moderator for the discussion. I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Jack and his work before passing things over to him. Uh, originally from Vancouver, Jack graduated from Innes College in 1994 and went on to study creative writing at the University of Arizona and at Florida State University where he earned a PhD. In 2014-15, he held the David T. K. Wong Creative Writing Fellowship at the University of East Anglia in Norwich, England. And in 2020, he was awarded a residency at historic Joy Kagawa House in Vancouver. Stories in Jack's debut collection, We Too Alone, have been shortlisted for the Commonwealth Short Story Prize and longlisted for the Journey Prize. He is now Associate Professor in the Department of Writing at Ithaca College in Ithaca, New York, where he lives with his writer wife and their two daughters. Please welcome Jack Wang. Thank you so much, Sharon, and uh, thank you, Bonnie. Uh, I want to take a moment as well to acknowledge the whole team at Innis, Rola, Francisca, Max, Hannah, and Ennis, uh, for all their work behind the scenes. And thanks to all of you, of course, for joining us tonight. Before I introduce tonight's esteemed writer, I uh, just want to give you a quick outline of the next hour or so. Uh, at the beginning, by way of introduction, um, our writer is going to give a short PowerPoint presentation. It'll be followed by a conversation during which there will also be a short reading. And uh, then we'll end with some questions from the audience. And we'll also be giving away um, to two people in the audience uh, copies uh, of, our, of our books. So please stick around for uh, that at the end. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce Subhan Kam Thamavongsa. Subhan Kam Thamavongsa's fiction has appeared in Harper's, Granta, The Atlantic, The Paris Review, Plowshares, Best American Non-Required Reading, The Journey Prize Stories, The O. Henry Prize Stories, and most recently, The New Yorker. Her debut collection, How to Pronounce Knife, was awarded the 2020 Sco Scotiabank Giller Prize, and is a finalist for the Penn Open Book Award and the National Book Critics Circle Award in the US. The title story was also a finalist for the Commonwealth Short Story Prize. The New York Times Book Review describes how to pronounce Knife as an impressive debut. Thamavong says, has a gift for the gently absurd. It is when the character's sense of alienation follows them home into the private space of the family that Tamabong says stories most wrench the heart. Author Mary Gateskill says, these poignant and deceptively quiet stories are powerhouses of feeling and depth. Tamabong is also the author of four books of poetry, Light, winner of the Trillium Book Award for Poetry, Found, Small Arguments, winner of the Relit Award, and most recently, Cluster. Born in the Lao refugee camp in Nang Kai, Thailand, she was raised and educated in Toronto. She is a member of the English faculty at Laurier, where she holds the inaugural Laurier Stedman Fellowship, and is currently the Carol Shields Writer in Residence at the University of Winnipeg. Please welcome Subankam Tamamongsa. Hi, Sivanka. Hi, Jack. Great to see you. You how too. Are you, how are you doing? <laughs> how have you been since um, I saw you last? Because I can imagine. Busy. Busy, busy. right? <laughs> has it been a, a, events uh, every other day or what every is it? Every day, like? uh, three or four. Um, and um, I think the, just this week, uh, you, you mentioned a short story in the New Yorker. Um, the 
New York Times asked me to write a review of Agni Doshi's novel, Burnt Sugar, which is coming out in print this Sunday. So life is non, has been pretty much nonstop since I, since I saw you last. Yeah, it feels that way, even yeah. though I'm also just at home. <laughs> does, does that mean you don't feel stressed anymore when you do these events? Um, not really, because yeah. I don't have to travel anywhere and I don't have to worry about where that place might be. Right. Um, yeah. So um, I'm a graduate of Innis and you're a graduate of NU. Um, so what, what, what's your fondest memory of the UT? Um, one of my favorite memories is going to my Ken Lit class as an undergrad and being given a copy of a textbook that we would use called 15 Canadian Poets Times Two. And I was just so thrilled because I thought, oh, well, that's only 30 poets. <laughs> and I was so excited because I felt like, you know, I, I could be part of that. Um, and actually, when uh, I would leave the classroom, um, many of those writers were uh, taught in the English department. Um, so I just felt like history or um, the future was happening right then and I could be part of it. Yeah, yeah. UT was also the place where I, you know, first got the notion of um, th that I might that I might be a writer or want to be a writer. <clears throat> so it's it's definitely nice to be back um, at the U of T, even even if virtual only virtually. Um, so I'd love to get to your PowerPoint presentation. Do you want to set it up in any way? Do you want to say anything? Um, just that uh, viewers should know that um, the voice that they hear is mine live. And it answers some of the basic questions that you might have about me. Um, so I'm just going to start that now. Hello, my name is Suvankam Tamavangsa. I am a writer. It's a bit difficult for me to say out loud. I grew up in a home without books. Any time I saw a bookshelf, I begged my parents to take a picture of me in front of it. like we do on vacation of the things we think we won't get to see again. My parents never went to school. If I wanted to work, in a chicken processing plant, picking worms, packaging store furniture. They knew the people I could talk to who could get me in. Where we come from, it's not a big deal to be a refugee. 
everyone we knew was one. It is a big deal to be a writer. After the Vietnam War ended, we were some of the three million people nobody wanted. I am asked, how do you find the courage to write? The truth is, it doesn't take courage. I am scared too. And I write with that. When I make things, I know they are taken to be quiet and small. I know There may be no place for them. I know no one is waiting. I know that it may be no one wants them. I must make them. I must. You must make your art wherever you are, whoever you are whatever you have, you must. This is something you can never teach a writer. They must find this over and over alone. This must. I tell my parents, I'm a writer now. And even though they don't really know exactly what that is, they know They don't know anyone who does that. And whatever that is in the world, they know I make one of those things on that bookshelf behind me. Thank you for that. Um, well, like your fiction, it's, it's beautiful and moving, uh, especially the pictures of you. And I'd, I'd love to ask some, start by asking some questions uh, um, about the presentation. Um, you said that you, you grew up in a home without books. Mm -hmm. You seemed drawn to books uh, at a young age. 
So can you describe uh, your relationship to books and reading as a child? Um, the minute that I walked into kindergarten, I knew that I had more or I would have more education than my parents. I remember uh, watching the other kids around me cry for their parents. I didn't cry. In fact, my mother cried and I told her she's grown up now and she'll be all right. And I walked into the kindergarten class by myself. Um, books for me at the time were things that other people owned that I couldn't have, but I saw them at school and I saw them um, at the pu public library. Um, and I just remember feeling like whatever those things are, I want to have them. Um, and the stories we read in school when, were never about people who looked like me or had a name like mine. I guess the closest was Rumpelstiltskin. Um, <laughs> I remember taking such great delight that nobody could guess his name. And I just thought, you know, no one could guess my name. And I just felt connected and like seen. Um, and I wanted to do, I wanted to make a thing or grow up to do, to make something that could make someone feel like they were less alone in the world. So you knew you wanted to do that, but but um, maybe because books were somewhat proximal or distant and because you didn't see um, many reflections of yourself, is, is that why you say I'm a writer? It's a bit difficult for me to say out loud. Why, why is it uh, difficult to say out loud? Well, I, when I say I'm a writer, um, before the Giller, I would get responses like, oh, is it in English? <laughs> or um, someone would say, oh, can I buy it at a bookstore? Um, or, you know, and um, yeah, um, that's, that's just uh, something I don't have to answer for anymore. So, um, you know, it makes me think of, um, <clears throat> something that Philip Roth apparently said, um, what's the difference between a writer and an Olympic swimmer? An Olympic swimmer doesn't think she's going to drown every time she enters the pool. Yeah. Um, because you talked about still being scared, even though you might be confident now uh, in your identity as a writer. Um, do you feel that kind of doubt and precarity that Roth describes, do you still feel that? Is that what you mean when you say you're scared? Always. Um, you're only as good as your next book. I've been writing for more than two decades and um, How to Pronounce Knife is, is probably readers' first encounter of what I do. Um, and if I ever waited for a prize to come along to tell me that what I do is good, I probably wouldn't write How to Pronounce Knife before this book, I had four. Um, and uh, that is just something that comes to mind often um, and uh, that I carry with me whenever I talk about or think about my writing, that these things don't happen overnight and that people discover you in different ways. And even winning does not make you safe. There will be a new winner next year and a new winner after that. And if you look at the history of the Giller, winning can sometimes be, doesn't guarantee anything. Um, we don't hear from some of those writers anymore. And there are many great Canadian writers who haven't come close or won. Um, so I keep that in mind as well. Yeah, so, you know, one thing that I think may no longer be true um, is that people probably are expecting your work now and, you know, looking forward to the next uh, Sivan Kam Tamabongsa story. I certainly am. And um, does, does that, does that um, 
add to the pressure? Um, it's a good question. Um, I, I, I think I would feel pressure if I was in my 20s, but I'm middle-aged and so I've been working for this uh, for more than two decades. So that, that readers want to hear from me, that's exactly what I want, um, yeah. So I don't, I don't feel pressure. Um, So some, something else you said um, was that, you know, if you wanted to work at a chicken processing plant or picking worms, your parents, um, you know, could point you to the right people. And some of those experiences are dramatized in the collection in stories like Paris and Picking Worms. So how does a, how does a writer make use of material that's close at hand? Um, are there risks to, to, to uh, to, to doing that? And does the material have to be transformed in that way? What's your relationship to that material? I think one, a writer has to get old um, and know these feelings and experiences deeply. Um, and as a writer, if you write about these topics, you have to be careful because people want to make you a talking head um, or they want to collapse um, the space between writing and writer and they want you to be a public figure. But the truth is I'm not that interesting. I really am a writer. I only, I only um, think about writing and I only think about reading. Um, I don't want to speak for anybody. I don't, I don't want to be a hero for anybody. Um, if we know anything about writers, um, they are not people that we should make heroes or we should allow them their mess if, if they have that. Mm -hmm. um, you, you just mentioned, you know, um, you know, not being in your 20s anymore, like some of some of this material, what, do you now have the right distance, you know, from them? Would you have been able to make use of them earlier in your career, some, some of these things, or was it necessary to get more distance? Um, I really like that distance. I'm a writer who's comfortable in the dark. I don't want people to know about who I am, or I don't want, I want to be, I don't want to be known. I want the writing to be known. And um, and every time someone tries to get to know that personal story, I always push out the art, the thing that I made um, and insist that um, it's fiction um, and that the fiction that I make um, can feel more real than the real thing itself. It's funny that you should say that because one of the pre-submitted questions did ask for more <laughs> autobiography. People often, you know, when they read fiction, right, they wonder what the relationship is to the writer's life. And, of course. and they wanted to know more about you. They're like, why can't we find out more about right. you? Understood. Uh, I wasn't going to ask that question, you know. Um, I, I think, um, yeah, um, but I think to preserve myself as a writer, you shouldn't know. Because what if for, the, you know, I've been writing for two decades and what if every year I talked about my life, um, then on the 25th year, you, you know my life and you'll be tired and, or, or, or you, I want a reader to live with the wonder of not knowing. We often think that knowing something is good for you, but I think if you knew it might take away the magic of the reading, the magic of the story, the magic of the thing that I made. Um, often when we see something beautiful, like a sunset, um, we don't need to know the mechanics of, of how that, you know, forms it, just enjoy it. Well, speaking of your work and, and, and putting it front and center, I think we'd love to hear a little bit of your work. So do you want to read from uh, a story? Sure. Um, I'm going to read from Edge of the World. Um, 
Once I started school, my mother watched the soaps alone and told me about them when I came home. There was always an affair, a long lost twin, someone in a coma, a handsome doctor. After a while, I didn't want to hear about them anymore. I started reading books and my mother would come sit with me and have me read them to her. She would ask questions about the drawings inside, the books she liked best were the scratch and sniff ones, and the ones where animals popped out at you. Each time I pulled the paper tab and a cat or a dog jumped out, she would draw in her breath, surprised and delighted by such a thing. There was one book about a sheep with a cotton patch inside. My mother would pet the cotton with her finger as if it was alive. At night, she would bring a book to my bed and insist I read it to her. There were not too many words inside. Sometimes she'd fall asleep right away, but when she didn't, I would make up stories for her. No one is ever alone in the world, I said. There's always a friend somewhere for everyone. She must have been 24 then, but she seemed much younger and smaller. I watched over her, and when she shivered, I pulled a blanket up to cover her, trying not to wake her. Sometimes she had nightmares. I could tell by how she was breathing, short, panicked breaths. I would reach out and stroke her hair, tell her things would be all right, even though I didn't know if they would be or what it meant to say those words. I just knew it helped to say them. I never thought to ask my mother why she slept in my room most nights. I was just glad not to be alone in the dark. My mother peered at the puzzle and pointed at a green spot, said that was where she was from. Then she pointed to the edge and then to the floor where there was nothing. It's dangerous there, she said, you fall off. No, you don't, I said. The world is round. It's like a ball. But my mother insisted, that's not right. Still, I continued, when you get to the edge, you come around to the other side. How do you know? She asked. I didn't know, actually. It's flat, my mother said, touching the map like this. Then she swept the puzzle to the floor with her palm. All the connected pieces broke off from each other, the hours lost in a single gesture. Just because I never went to school doesn't mean I don't know things. I thought of what my mother knew then. She knew about war, what it felt like to be shot at in the dark, what death looked like up close in your arms, what a bomb could destroy. Those were things I didn't know about and it was all right not to know them living where we did now in a country where nothing like that happened. There was a lot I did not know. We were different people and we understood that then. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'm thinking about that moment in the story and it really does, it, the story kind of hinges on that moment where the mother asserts her belief that the world is flat. And um, I think many people might read that moment as a moment of anger and shame when she sweeps the puzzle off the table or only anger and shame, but, but you see it as more, right? You see it as, as, as more than that, that moment in the story? Yeah, different forms of knowledge. Um, when someone doesn't know something, they shouldn't be ashamed of what they don't know what they do know is different from what you know um, and how they earned what they know is valuable to them and you have to respect that. Um, and in that scene, um, that's how, um, that's how you encounter um, how different you are as a child 
in terms of your role. Um, when, when it's not just a geographical difference, um, it's an intimate and closer difference. Um, and, and you have to live with both ideas of knowledge in one space. So what you're saying makes me think of a couple of other stories in the collection, the title story, for example, how to pronounce knife. Um, the narrator insists that the word knife is pronounced with a hard K because that's what her, what her father told her. And also Chickachee, where the narrator insists that she went Chickachee, mm -hmm. not, not trick or treating uh, the night before when she's talking to her teacher. Um, are those moments similar in that you're granting the characters their knowledge or their not knowing, as it were? Definitely. Um, and in their not knowing, I never, in reviews, I've read reviewers saying that the child or the children are ashamed and humiliated, but that is not there at all in these stories. What the children are, are alone with the language. Um, and in Chickachee, not only are they alone, it, um, it's incredibly funny. Um, and they, it is the reason why the children get a lot of candy in the bag. Um, and then it asks the question, well, what's the right way to say trick or treat? Should it be the correct way that everyone else says or Chickachee and get, and it, the, the answer is, it doesn't matter because the candy is in the bag. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, um, the, those moments in the story, the, the kids are, you know, they're partly defiant, but also in Chickachee, especially, they're kind of jubilant about it, you know? So I agree. Yeah, that's not really the, the you know, shame isn't really uh, what the kids are feeling uh, uh, in those moments in the story. Um, you know, since you read that section of Edge of the Worlds, I think I'm going to, you know, ask something that uh, was one of the pre-submitted questions. Okay. Edge of, the, Edge of the World is one of the one of the stories where, you know, the parents or, or the experience of war percolates up in the story. Often, you know, the stories aren't explicit about it, but it might be percolating beneath the surface. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, um, you know, about how those um, experiences might have shaped you and your work and I guess I would ask too do you feel like um, you are um, able to write about it and sort of but elided some of those things didn't really want to um, bring it totally to the surface or um, is it something that you feel comfortable with but chose not to delve into more? Well I'm a writer of fiction if anyone wants to read about Laos as a country, they could read it in history, you know, in a history book. Mm -hmm. But also, that's the thing, in a history book, um, it's often just a footnote. Um, it's a country that we don't hear a lot about or from, especially in discussions of the Vietnam War. Um, and I don't want to be the person who gives a history lesson. I want to talk about um, the, the act of making art. Um, how do I get a reader, like when I say my father, how do I get a reader to feel that it's their father? How do I get a reader who's never had a single drop of um, fermented fish sauce feel nostalgic for it as if they've had it every day in their life? Uh, like those are the small achievements um, that I want with the book and that I've seen the response to the, the, the book. Um, and I take great joy that people feel um, that seen or that it's about them or that I stood right next to them when they were a child and they, and they seem to think that I'm describing something that they lived well, there's a question in the, ch in, the, in the chat about the end of the story. And, um, you know, it, I, I, it might speak to what I wanted to ask about next. Um, sometimes diasporic writers feel cornered into writing about sadness 
uh, or suffering. Um, but but you've said that you don't think of your stories as, as sad at all. And I don't know if, you know, the, the, the laughter at the end of uh, Edge of the World speaks to that. But um, yeah, um, I don't see my stories um, as being sad or traumatic. I mean, there are sad moments. And for some people, it would feel traumatic. Um, if anything, I feel that these stories are about joy. Um, we have a very narrow view of what joy is. For some people, it's to have a job, to have a home, um, and, and or to be able to say that they own their own business, to be able to protect a parent if they're a child. Um, those are joys that are incredibly large and wide in a person's life. Um, and, and, and just thinking back to the ending of Edge of the World, um, yeah, there are two spots uh, where I could have ended the story. One, when I talk about the mother um, leaving, could have ended it there, could have also ended it saying that the father didn't cry because as a refugee, um, what, what losing or his wife walking away from him is no big deal. All the grief he's ever done, had, had all the grief that he could ever feel in this life has already been felt. There are no more tears. But I do push it a little further. I, I end on the sound of laughter and the image of someone's mouth, a voice loud and wild. Um, and, and I think that's the difference between getting, getting someone to, to feel like, like it's a story about them um, or, or getting a reader to feel that what I made is true. So, um, you know, you're saying that, you know, you're often seeking um, joy in, uh, in your stories. Uh, you've also said that um, stories should also be devastating. <laughs> and you used that word in your recent interview in The New Yorker, uh, talking about good looking and um, a moment in the story being devastating. Um, so so what, uh, what does that word mean to you? What, what particular quality or effects are you after if um, you know, you're trying to be devastating in a story? <clears throat> Um, joy itself can be devastating, like, like perhaps someone else's joy and your proximity to it um, is devastating because it's not something that you can have. Um, in the New Yorker interview, I talk about the distance between, in the, narr the narrator, I had started with the line, um, the man thought he was, you know, that he was good looking. He was fit, if you like that sort of thing. And it was just distance. It had to come from the voice of someone who has that distance, but watched and loved that man his whole life. And so it turned out to be, I made it the voice of the son. Um, I wanted to people to be uncomfortable or embarrassed to use terms like, love of my life. I, it's so ordinary, um, but I wanted any time anyone heard that phrase to feel like uh, suspicious of what does that mean exactly? Um, because that whole story is about someone calling so someone the love of their life. Um, on the subject of distance, I, I, you know, one of the things I really admire about your stories is your, your handling of point of view. Mm -hmm. And um, I do feel like you, you, you really effectively create separation or distance between the narrator and the character. Um, you know, even that story, Good Looking, it's, I believe it's told in first person, but it's really the child looking at the main character, the father. Um, but in third person too, I often feel like I'm trapped in a character's head. Mm -hmm. can't get out of that um, character's head even when I want to, um, but you strike that really nice balance in terms of having that narrative distance. Does that come really naturally to you or do you have to 
you know, re reestablish uh, the right distance with every story? Um, it comes very naturally. Um, at whatever I'm doing, I'm describing it in the th in with that distance. Um, whether it's a simple task as doing the dishes or hearing someone on the phone, um, in my head, um, any daily normal task, I just narrate it like my narrators in my stories. Um, I don't. I, I don't like to put myself at my own personal self at the center of a story. I'm I'm comfortable in the dark. And in fact, actually, when we cast um, an actor for the for the audio book, um, I got to choose the actor, and I picked a man because I knew that I could achieve that distance even further if a man narrated these stories. There would be no, no wonder or, or, or about, you know, is it about him? Um, whereas I don't, I don't have, as the writer, I don't have that distance when I encounter readers with my book. Yeah. Um, I'm often attached to the thing that I'm that uh, that I've made. Right. Yeah. You. I mean, it sounds like you really just want your fiction to be separate, read separately from yourself, right? You really want it to be a thing unto itself. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, on the subject of good looking, you mentioned how the story worked when it was from the child's point of view, and somebody asked a question, pre-submitted a question about. Um, you know, the decision to adopt the voice of a child in so many of your stories in the book. Um, you know, technically, none of the stories, I don't think, are, you know, told in the voice of a child. They're all told. They're all the, adult, adult stories. I mean, I've, I've, I've seen uh, people buying these this the book for their ch ch young children and i have to tell them um they're adult stories right um, yeah but nonetheless the, the stories of uh, often filtered the experiencing narrator is often a child yeah even the person telling the story is older so so what do you find fruitful about the, the vantage point of children um well in the end it's sort of like a surprise in the it's only in the last paragraph that you find out that the person who's telling the story is actually the child and 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 that they're grown up um one of the things about the view or the voice of the child is you take everything in and it's new um there's no there's no grounding. There, there are no bearings. Um, the reader, the, the character doesn't have a bearing and the reader doesn't, doesn't have a bearing. I don't give anybody their bearings. And because I don't do that, we're all in the same place. We're discovering and seeing everything through the eyes of someone who finds this whole world strange. Right. Yeah, I love those moments. Um you know, dramatic irony when you're seeing things through the eyes of a child, things that might have become ordinary to us, like picture day or the game of tag, you know, those <laughs> moments um, right. are seen through the eyes of the child. And we know, um, but the child doesn't know, those moments of dramatic irony are, are really rich and wonderful. Even a moment like the car with the V and the W, like, you know, <laughs> uh, and... Um, <clears throat> Those moments in the story, I think, point of view is working really well. Um, so one one last thing about good looking, you know that uh, that story also ends m many years later, right? When the child and 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 yeah. that's also the case with Edge of the World. There are a few stories with that make that move when we're we're many years, yeah, you know, many years uh, into the future. Um, is is that um, trying to capture something about? The, the passage and the, the pathos of time. Um, what, is, what, do you, what do you like about that move? Um, I think it says something about us as adults that we don't take in the world as clearly um, as we did when we were younger. Um, and the things that hurt us or the things that we remember um, we never encounter them the same way as an adult. 
um, I find that when adults talk about their childhood memories, they speak in the voice of who they were at that age, um, their vocabulary, their language, they sound like they did when they were children, even, even the quietness of that voice. Um, and so for me, I feel the narration of that moment is, is the same, even when you're an adult. Hmm. Thank you. Um, so uh, your stories are also really funny. And, um, you know, they, they mix humor and pathos very well. How do you think about um, comedy or humor or levity in your work? And again, is it just something that comes quite naturally to you? Um, I think this is something that my parents instilled in me. You know, we encountered sadness so often that um, we use language or we reword or revision or reimagine the thing that makes us sad. Like, for example, if I had a hole in my shoe and my parents couldn't afford to get me a new pair, they would never admit that they can't afford that or that I would never get a pair. What they would say is that my shoe is high tech and that come summer, they, you know, everyone will want this new style. It, it, it is natural air conditioning. So to me, whenever I encounter something that makes me sad, my instinct is to turn, to make a turn and, and, and frame it in something that can make me laugh. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, it makes me, um, what you're saying reminds me, I think there's a line in, I think it's picking worms. Um, there are families that are talking and I think it's something like the sadder the story, the louder the laughter. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is there something about, is there something about, you know, sort of um, the way in which people were turning these, you know, sometimes difficult, sometimes even tragic stories and, and, and turning them into something else through, uh, through humor? I always thought it was funny. Um, whenever I had seen an interview between two refugees and they were both so sad about their stories and they made the audience cry. And I was thinking back to parties that my parents would have and every refugee there tried to outdo each other with a story. Um, and the sadder the story got, the louder the laughter was. And I just, like that was my sense of, um, or my experience of um, the way that my parents talked about what happened to them. Yeah, that was, was, sorry, go ahead. Oh, and I wanted to bring, to bring that scene um, to say that there's no one way for someone to tell a story. Yeah, I, I got very much that sense of one-upsmanship in, in that scene, you know, trying to outdo each other with hardship, but all, but making each other laugh. Um, I thought that was, you know, a wonderful moment. So who do you, who do you imagine when you write? Do you, do you have an ideal reader or someone in your mind? And I guess it goes to some degree to the question, you know, of writing about sadness and suffering, because sometimes there are expectations of what kinds of stories that the diasporic writer tells. So who do you imagine when you're writing your stories? Well, one thing, I'm, I don't hate myself. So I never write stories where I hate myself. Um, I also don't, in my stories, I also don't try to prove to readers that these people, that the people I'm writing about are human. I assume that they are. Um, and so who am I? I'm, I'm looking for um, like a reader who pays attention, um, a reader who wants to know the truth and only the truth. Um, and I want to give it to that reader um, with absolute clarity um, and an unflinching gaze. I want when someone 
closes the book, I want them to still think about the characters and, and feel like they're alive um, very much. You know, a, a lot of, we divide readers um, into, you know, readers of fiction and readers of poetry. But I think um, both forms are after the same project. We just, I want a reader to pay attention and I want them to come back again and again and to see and to pay attention um, and to notice new things, to discover new things um, that expand or that expand their reading experience. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in, um, in your bio, it said that you were working on a novel. Um, you, you've mm -hmm. said before that a short story can do everything a novel can do, only it doesn't waste your time. Uh, but you're but you're working on a novel, so presumably. Well, uh, you know, well. I I I like to um, give fighting words because <laughs> you know a lot of people put down the short story that it's a lesser form, but I wanted to. So I made a point of saying it can give you everything a novel can, and it doesn't waste your time. Yeah, that's, I am having a lot of trouble working on the novel because I don't know how to waste people's time. <laughs> and so, you know, when I deal with the form, I, I struggle with time and how to use it up. Um, my instinct is to go in there to do as much damage and then run away and um, leave people devastated. Right. But you can't you know, you have to build that with a novel um, and you have to sustain it. Um, and it, it's very hard, but, um, you know, I make things harder for myself, such as saying, undoing, I mean, such as putting down the form of the novel and then trying to write it myself. <laughs> is, there, is there a novel you particularly admire that yeah, it does what you think a novel does best. Wow. Um, I really love um, Emma Klein's The Girls. Um, it's just when I get to that last page, I don't even notice, um, you know, that there were 300 before, or just recently, Avni Doshi's Burnt Sugar. Um, there's so much writing on the first line of a novel. It has to do so much um, because it has to sustain, grab a reader till the very end. And the thing about Avni Doshi's novel is that it's such an original voice. Um, it's a friend, it feels like a friend you long to just follow around. And so when you get to that last sentence of her novel, you're so, you're so sad that you can't hear that voice anymore and that you have to close the book. Mm -hmm. So for me, a recent example is her book. Mm -hmm. So um, people are probably wondering, and so I'll ask on their behalf, but but are, can you tell us anything about your novel or would you rather not? Um, I could tell you about it. Um, it I'm really interested in Raymond Clonot's, um exercises in style. Um, so one event happens, but who you are and how you live and what you know, you can only see that event through through those experiences, the way that you narrate what you see is determined by your whole life. Um, and it's a novel that works with one event, um, but there are many characters and nobody knows what that one event is. It's just hovering outside or it's just hovering um, and we, we can just sense that it's there, but I don't tell you what it is. Hmm. Is there a pub date? No, but I but I would have to tell you it's late because <laughs> because I was supposed to hand it in in December, but then I won the Giller, so then I got distracted. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That actually leads to my last question before I 
turn to some uh, audience, more audience questions. But, you know, as writers, we're often expected to put things out in the world. Clearly, you're, you know, you have to, under deadline with this novel, you, you have to do all these events, constantly putting things out into the world. So how, how do you, you know, find time to take things in? What, how do you nourish and replenish yourself artistically and intellectually? Uh, what are some of the things you do to, to um, keep yourself? Um, I just remember the joy of getting to do this, um, that it took a long time. Um, and that, and that there wasn't always someone waiting to read it. Um, and, um, I think about, I think about pushing myself, um, as in making turns where people don't expect where I will go and surprising them. Um, how do I, yeah, it's something that you learn throughout your writing, your writing career. Um, you learn it when you're 16, when you're 25, when you're 30. Um, it's not one, it's not you learn it once and then it's forever. It's a constant learning process. Mm -hmm. And what I tell you today will probably change by tomorrow afternoon. Right. Um, right. You know, like there's a constant adjusting, redefining what, what you want to do or how you, where to follow your joy. Right, right. Um, so I'm gonna um, turn to some some questions, and if, if people have questions, you're welcome to um, submit them in the Q&A. Um, so some of these questions I have already touched on. Um, and a lot of people did ask about, um, you know, what you just talked about, the questions about motivation and uh, staying disciplined. Um, there's, there's a, there's a question in the chat about, um, the, you know, the, this, the familiar question, advice to aspiring writers, do you, what, what is your, what is your, <laughs> what is your advice to it, aspiring writers? What do you tell? I, oh, for those of you who've been to my other events, um, I'm just going to say it again. Stop asking for advice. <laughs> that is the best advice. How do you know with me with five books that I myself don't need advice? Um, I think a, a writer or an, or an aspiring writer, they don't need advice. They know what they're doing. And if they don't, figure out what makes you fantastic and do that. <laughs> Oh, so my advice is, yeah, when, when you ask for advice, it means you're giving up the thing that makes you fantastic and, and you're veering away from the love and care that you should give it. Um, like, don't open yourself up to let someone else define for you, um, like, what you should be. And that's what advice is. You don't need advice. That's, that's really interesting, um, because sometimes I do feel that, you know, when writers give advice, they're really, they're just de describing themselves, right? <laughs> you know, we, I mean, it, it, we, we're describing right. what worked for us and sure. describing things that are really inherent, perhaps, to our own personalities and our own experiences. And, and sometimes that advice, as you're suggesting, is really not something that's transferable or... or um, useful to, to somebody else. Um, I think, you know what, if I, if I could offer a piece of advice that I think can be helpful is, um, nobody asked me, but I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna. No, I want, I want I, to know, I, like, do you give advice? You know, I, I, I only because I think young writers are, are seeking uh, that, um, you know, that sort of guardrail that they can hold on to you know for for a little bit of stability or, or, or I don't know bit, you're I bit. think you're a nicer person <laughs> well you know yeah. I think you're still <laughs> right so I, I I've said this right we know <laughs> um 
the, I'm referring for those out there to the to you know the Wild Writers Festival when I described Sue's you know approach to her characters and the way she can be very you know un unflinching as you said and unsentimental in your in your treatment of your characters. You yourself, of course, are, are warm and delightful, but <laughs> but. Um, you know, I think that, um, I think it's helpful to just, you know, something Richard Bausch, the American writer said is just ask yourself, did I do, did I work today? That's the only question to ask, mm -hmm. did, did I work today? You know, we're always think. young writers are all, you know, as I recall when I was a young writer, and I still think it now, am I good, am I bad? Was this a good day, a bad day? The only question to ask is, did I work today? Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's good advice, you know? Um, it is. And, and it's kind of like uh, uh, Isaac Den Denison who said, you know, I write every day without hope and without despair. And that's something I still can't do. I mean, every day it's hope and despair, but I, that's I, I think that's good advice to try, you know, to, to just ask that I work today um, and not hope and despair. Did you work today? I worked briefly, but I mostly worked on thinking about this. I did a little bit of, <laughs> I did a little bit of work. To, to answer yes to that question, to answer yes to that question. Um, let's see, uh, other people have asked um, some questions. Uh, uh, I, I asked some of them already, but, you know, there's a question about what your family thinks about your work. Uh, you have, have your parents come to, you know, a, a, a fuller appreciation of your of your work or your status now in, in the literary community? Um, how, does your, how, how does your family respond to the success you've had? They don't, you know, they don't have a measure of what this looks like. Um, like if I tell them I finished a book, they'll be like, well, you're a writer, isn't that what's supposed to happen? You yeah. finish a book, you know. Um, to them, a job is a job. Um, you know, when you pave a road, you don't call home and say, hey, mom and dad, look, I paved a road. Or when a gar you know, when you come and collect someone's garbage, you don't call home each time. It's the job. Well, my, my dad just keeps asking if I'm selling a lot of books. <laughs> I, have <to> tell, <laughs> I, I have to tell him. Uh, not really, not really, but I'm, you know, it's okay. It's okay. Um, <laughs> um, let's see if the other questions, I'm going to look and see if there's some other questions in the chat. Um, so someone is asking about um, the spareness of your style. Yeah. It being immensely successful. Is that something you have to achieve through a lot of cuts and edits or is your economy come to you naturally? It just comes to me naturally. And, and I know this because I have a record of books that I've been writing for two decades. And the other day I read my first book, which I wrote as an undergrad at U of T um, called Small Arguments. And the language is very bare and spare. Um, one of the things that it's a risk to take because the ease that that spare writing gives a reader is that it conceals how technical you are, um, and you you can't you can't tell a reader what you're doing. Um, you have to hide how technical that is. The ease that they get, um, it's actually a risk. Um, there's no flourish to hide behind. Um, so for me, I, I feel like it's, it's something very difficult to do. And what I get from a lot of people who encounter my writing is that they feel that they could do it too. Um, uh, but, you know, I think of the spareness. It's sort of like, you know, a Jackson Pollock painting. Everyone thinks it's just drips. And then when they try it, it's, I, right, it right. doesn't have the same kind of energy. It's very technical, mm -hmm. um, but you don't know that until you actually try. Um, you know, the question is, how do I say this and this and this? 
um, because you don't say that you, in, in, in what you leave on the page, how do you get people to finish the rest of it or, or to hold, to let a blank or to, to let what little is there do so much work. Right. Right. Um, there, there are a number of questions that are going back to the presentation and, and, um, interested in your childhood relationship to books. Did, did you have a particular formative reading experience that you remember? Um, um, I remember going to the public library and this was before audiobooks. It, it's like a cheap form of an audiobook where there was a plastic bag and inside it was a cassette and a book. Um, and even though we didn't own books at home, my parents did own a cassette player. And I would play this cassette and the voice on the cassette pronounced things properly. Um, but also, I it reminded me of, that's how my mom wrote letters to her mother. She would record her letters on a cassette. Um, so to me, the cassette was like, was like a letter, a book. Um. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm trying to um, look at the questions in the Q&A as I listen. Um, so we're, we're coming up um, to the end of our time, coming toward the end of our time. So I just want to ask, uh, let's see, one more question. Somebody wondered how you felt when you completed the collection. Were you sad to have come to the end? Were you, were you happy <laughs> to get to I the felt end? like, like a reader, you know, yeah. I was laughing at my stories and I was crying at the moments where I intended a reader to cry. I knew the book was done when I stopped being the writer and I was the reader and I was enjoying it. Great, thank you so much. Um, thanks for the wonderful conversation um, and all your insights. Um, one of the joys for me of just having published a book is just the people I've had uh, a chance to meet and it's it's really been delightful getting to know you, Simanka. Yeah. Um, thank you, Rola. Do we have, because I think we're gonna uh, do the a book giveaway and uh, Rola, do you have those names for me? I can give them to you, Jack, said the voice from nowhere. Okay, oh, here they are. Sorry, I was looking at the Q&A, but here it's in the chat. Um, so the giveaway winners are, a copy of each of our books, is David Clanfield. And, um, and I guess David is the former principal of New College. <laughs> College. Um, and, uh, my apologies if I mispronounce his name, Yash Van Kia, I believe, um, Yash Van Kia is the, Yash and David are winners tonight, so congratulations, and thanks again, Sivan Khan, for this wonderful conversation. No, um, thank you, Jack. I'm sure you this can, has been you know, really lovely. Just imagine the virtual applause across the continent, uh, 300 plus people. Wow. Um, and uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to Charlie Kyle, the principal of Innes College. Well, thanks to both of you. Um, I don't want to sound like too much of a gusher, but, and this is gonna get me in a lot of trouble with the filmmakers we invite, but nothing pleases me more than hearing two writers talk about writing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And I think it's partly because it, it is by its nature an, a solitary and contemplative process. So that you obviously have a lot of time to think about it. There's a double pleasure that I, at least comes for the listener from my perspective, is that you get to hear the work that you've enjoyed turned over, but you also get to hear about the process and the process also turned over. So um, I think I speak for everyone when I say thank you to both of you. Uh, for giving us this opportunity to have a great writer talk to a great writer. You can figure out which of the great writers each of you is. Um, and, uh, and for pleasing a whole lot of people, we had a huge number of attendees and I think that they probably all enjoyed it as much as I did. 
And that is my way of artfully segueing to my duties at the end of this event to talk about our next events. And so if you enjoyed this one, chances are you will enjoy two that we have coming up. The first is on March 18th, uh, we have Innes alumna Sapora Berman and her talk, which I have somehow managed to misplace, but I, I think I can remember it. It's Pipelines, Politics and Power. Uh, it's a talk on fossil fuel and, in a world of fire. And the uh, moderator for that event will be Tad Homer Dixon. And then on April 15th, we will have an all in this panel on the future of cities post COVID. It will be uh, with Greg Lintern, it's Toronto City Planner, uh, but also Kofi Hope, Cherise Berta, and Steve Laveau, or Steve DeVoe, sorry. And the moderator for that one will be Rahul Bardwaj. So March 18th, April 15th, mark those in your calendars. And I wanna thank uh, our team. Jack did a wonderful job of naming them all at the beginning, so I won't do it again, but also thanks to New College for partnering with us. Uh, it's been a great experience. Hope we'll do it again. And finally, one more time, thank you to our two guests, Subankam Tamavongza and Jack Wayne. Thanks so much to both of you. And good night, everybody. <laughs>